throat, you keep trying to hold all this in, I'm afraid your mustache is going to pop off. Ted Lasso's second season is about the dangers of toxic positivity. Back in season one, Ted's relentless optimism won over his world and ours at a time when this was incredibly needed. But by season two, Ted's refusal to look anywhere but on the sunny side of things is looking less and less healthy. He's putting off getting the help he needs for his mental health. I'm actually feeling a lot better, so I don't even know if this is necessary, really. <laughs> risking his team's performance and avoiding dealing with the deep insecurity of Nate Shelley, the brilliant yet fragile assistant coach who's increasingly lashing out in arrogant, insulting behavior. Well, you like a painting at a Holiday Inn. You know, you don't inspire, you don't move people. Eventually, Nate feels so abandoned by Ted that in the finale, he turns to the dark side, defecting to West Ham, now led by Rebecca's terrible ex-husband, Rupert. So how did this happen? Here's our take on how Ted Lasso's forced smile positivity can fuel dangerous negativity, what really went wrong with Nate, and how you can achieve a light side that's based on a genuine rock-solid foundation. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all our new videos. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, an online community offering thousands of classes by creative instructors. Right now, the first 1,000 viewers to click the link in the description below will get an entire month of Skillshare for free. Learn the secrets of better self-care from Queer Eye's Jonathan Van Ness, or let plated head chef Elena Karp help you become a whiz in the kitchen. There is truly a class for any interest you have. Click the link in the description to try Skillshare today. Hey, may the force be with you. And also with you. In season one, Ted Lasso's force of nature personality acts as a Jedi-esque magic that inspires hope in his players. But Nate Shelley's transformation into the villain of season two illustrates why, even offered the power of the light side, we might still choose to embrace darkness. Nate's character arc actually mirrors one of our culture's most iconic antagonists, Darth Vader. Nate Shelley and Anakin Skywalker are both naturally gifted prodigies whose abilities are recognized and elevated by a positive mentor. The prophecy in Star Wars that claims Anakin will bring balance to the Force Is he not to destroy the Sith and bring balance to the Force? is also echoed in Nate's promotion from kit manager to assistant coach, where it seems his understanding of football tactics combined with Ted's empathic team management will culminate in a more complete team that gets wins. However, like Anakin, Nate grew up without a loving father figure and is plagued by insecurities that combined with a lot of anger, ego, and hunger for glory. Do you guys ever want to be in charge? Be the boss? Get all the credit? Leave him vulnerable to charismatic negative influences. This light side, dark side binary in Ted Lasso is intentional. Creators Bill Lawrence and Jason Sudeikis have explicitly compared the series' second season to The Empire Strikes Back. Like in that film, the Luke Skywalker figure, Ted himself, ends on a down note. And just as the Empire Strikes Back complicates and challenges the light side of the Force, in season two, Ted's brand of positivity is tested, especially through the character of Nate. Everybody loves you. The great Ted Lasso, well, I, I think you're a f joke. Nate's descent into prickdom, as Vulture calls it, begins during a seemingly innocuous plot of taking his parents out to their favorite restaurant for their anniversary. Whereas positivity and kindness open doors for the charming Ted, acting nice and even playfully offering his status as a football coach doesn't get Nate the window table he wants, and he ends up feeling embarrassed and powerless. I'm sorry, I can't guarantee a reservation for the window table. I know Roy Kent. Well, please let us know if Mr. Kent ever wants the window table. What does get Nate that table is abandoning kindness and confidently demanding that he's listened to. You're gonna give us that table? While this moment feels like a win, he's learning to be a more assertive version of himself as Keeley and Rebecca wanted. The scene underscores that a lack of self-confidence is fueling his newfound aggression. Just before he speaks to the waitress, he uses self-hatred as a motivator by spitting in the mirror. Like we'll see him do again later in the season after he's embarrassed by misreading the moment and kissing Keeley. Because his unbridled assertiveness gets him the table he wants, where Ted's philosophy failed, the event validates and emboldens the darker, more entitled side of Nate's personality. He taps into these same qualities to carry the team to victory in Richmond's quarterfinal match when he overrides the doubts of the other coaches and team to implement his risky park-the-bus tactic. I don't, we gotta be aggressive here, right? 
I think we need... Reynolds! Winchester! Baba Twende! You're going in! This leads him to get a wave of public praise, which grows his ego, and making him increasingly narcissistic and power-hungry, yet simultaneously more fragile than ever. I mean, I did, I did say Wonderkind. Uh. But no, this is great. Thank, it's really funny. Good Thank you. <laughs> As he obsessively scans headlines and listens to podcasts about himself, Nate is buying into very real misconceptions that external validation will cure self-doubt and career success will automatically bring us happiness, when in fact, blindly following ambition can often mean not working out our inner demons. Showrunner Lawrence confirms that Nate's fundamental issue is low self-esteem. Quote, we'd all be lying if we didn't say we knew plenty of people who get success that say, now it's my turn to do all the shit that was done to me. That's the bummer about low self-esteem and the seduction of fame, power, and success. If you ever do anything to humiliate me again, I'll make you like a misery. Meanwhile, Nate's surrogate father figure, Ted, isn't providing enough support to counter the pull of the dark side. Throughout season two, Ted is wrapped up in his own personal issues, so the initial positive reinforcement Nate got from Ted championing him goes away, allowing all these insecurities to fester. The scene in the finale where Nate explains to Ted why he's turned on his mentor underlines what kind of toxic positivity Ted is guilty of in Nate's eyes. He made me feel like I was the most important person in the whole world. And then he abandoned me. At the game's most pivotal point, Ted has a panic attack and literally runs off the field, which seems triggering for Nate. Don't abandon the game. And then, when Nate responds to that situation by miraculously pulling off a win, he doesn't feel that Ted truly notices as much as he should. More importantly, Ted's always positive outlook only scratches the surface of Nate's insecurities, not confronting the core problems. In the season two finale, even though he knows Nate leaked the story about his panic attacks, he's still avoiding dealing with the Nate issue. Well, you know my philosophy when it comes to cats, babies, and apologies, coach. You gotta let them come to you. That's not gonna happen. Some people need a little push. Yeah, well, I'm pushing nobody. Or indirectly serving him vague inspirational quotes, which just serve to annoy Nate. It is our choices, gentlemen, that show what we truly are, far more than our abilities. Despite this valid criticism of Ted, though, what's most striking in their argument scene is how Nate is really angry with himself. And if I didn't tell you how important you were to me enough, I'm sorry about that. No, no, you know, you're full of shit. He's mad at himself for leaking the story about Ted and furious that he made a pass at Keeley, which led him to be, in his view, humiliated by receiving both Keeley's and Roy's pity and understanding. You made a mistake, Nate. Don't worry about it. No, no, I deserve to be headbutted. The truth is that his rants about others' bad intentions are projections. He believes Ted must be setting him up to fail. And now you're going to play Nate's false nine to win the team cup, which they will. Okay, you can blame it on me. When of course that's something Nate might do, but Ted never would. And in fact, Ted and the team both genuinely trust in Nate's abilities. The tactic is sound. The problem is Nate takes every tiny piece of feedback he gets personally, like a terrible insult, instead of as an opportunity to be humble and improve. There is validity to Nate's anger. Yes, as the team manager, Ted's responsible for the team's performance, for better or worse. Give Ted yet another idea he'll take all the credit for. <sighs> That's the job, son. But Nate's knowledge of the game is arguably what has made the team competitive, and he's still treated somewhat dismissively or patronizingly by a lot of the other characters. Fact is, Isaac is a big dog, you know, so he's only gonna respond to a big dog himself. I'll do it. <laughs> Oh, you're being serious. I'm sorry about that, Nate. It's an imbalance made even starker given both coaches' backgrounds. Nate is a working class person of color who's been working his way up for years, while Ted is a complete outsider with no knowledge of the sport flown in by the wealthy ownership. This, di this didn't just fall into my lap, right? I, I earned this. I know you did, Nate. Sometimes the natural reaction to a perceived injustice is anger, and it's okay to feel it. It's just crucial to air and discuss it when you do. Because Nate can't find a constructive way to vent in Ted's happy-go-lucky locker room, his anger becomes toxic and eats away at him until he feels he has no choice but to throw away everything he's built at Richmond. Nate's petty arrogance in season two makes him an easy to hate, slow burning villain in the making. But when we step back, there's something uncomfortably relatable about Nate's turn toward the dark side. 
Watching ultra-happy, ultra-successful people get recognized can be alienating, especially when everything seems to come easy to them, or we feel underappreciated for our efforts. Even watching Ted Lasso with its cast of wonderfully kind, rich, famous people being great friends and living their best lives could, instead of inspiring us to emulate them, just as easily depress us because our own situations and behavior probably can't measure up to that high bar. Is it tacky to say I'm rich on an online dating profile? I don't need to put the word filthy in front of it. Ted's whole philosophy is that to be the best players and coaches on the field, you have to be a better person everywhere. Nate instead is laser focused on becoming an elite soccer coach at the expense of everything else, including being a good person or a personal role model for his players. Yet many people agree with Nate that this is the price of success and Ted's record isn't proof that he's taking the most direct route to winning. I'm telling you, all these ties are my fault. As his hair slowly becomes a sleek silver, Nate even appears to be physically transforming into a near doppelganger of Jose Mourinho, the divisive, iconic football manager known for his arrogant, mean-spirited personality, but also his brilliant tactical mind and track record as one of the most successful managers ever. Please don't call me arrogant because what I, I'm saying is true. I'm European champion. I'm a, I think I'm a special one. Well, just do what had to be done. It's not like I'm some kind of wonder kid. <laughs> So through Nate, the story raises this very legitimate challenge. Maybe turning to the dark side can potentially bring you more glory if that's what you want most of all. Well, I mean, what do you want to talk about? Why don't you tell me what happened the other night? Yeah, I don't want to do this. In season two, it becomes clear Ted Lasso's positivity isn't all roses and home-baked biscuits. It's also being used to cover up fear and avoid dark realities. Even in the show's early episodes, toxic positivity is present in the way Ted won't face that his marriage is failing. When his family comes to visit him in England, his insistence on having fun and his confidence that their long-term arrangement can work cause his wife to hide away and burst into tears. And we see how toxic positivity can actually be distressing as she feels she has to deny her feelings and vows to push through her pain. I'll keep trying. It's understandable how audiences latched onto Ted Lasso's optimism in the series' 2020 first season with millions needing a lift to escape the bad news as the COVID pandemic hit. But according to co-creator Bill Lawrence, quote, we were all very surprised the way the show was being treated as a TV show that is the human equivalent of a hug. We felt this was about a guy whose wife is leaving him with his child even though he still loves her. Like anytime I try to solve any of her problems or do something sweet for her, it just, backfire. This failure to catch on to how Ted's positivity already contained toxic and avoidant elements in season one actually coincided with a rise of toxic positivity in our own culture. As psychologist Dr. Jamie Long writes, with something as unpredictable and uncertain as COVID-19, a knee-jerk reaction might be to slap on an overly optimistic or positive face to avoid accepting a painful reality. In season two, though, Ted's panic attacks are his body forcing him to acknowledge that something deeper is wrong, and the key breakthrough in his behavior comes through his relationship with the team's new therapist, Dr. Sharon. Ted's not used to scratching beneath his surface self. He pushes away any feelings that don't fit his nice good guy identity, and at first he's so resistant to opening up in therapy that when he can't use sweets or humor to deflect. That's very thoughtful, Coach Lasher but I don't eat sugar. He literally runs away. Dr. Sharon's entry into the overly positive culture Ted's created is so crucial because while she's ultimately working for the positive too, she's doing it through recognizing the necessity of honesty, especially with ourselves. Eventually, we learn Ted's positivity is in part a defense mechanism shaped by profound sadness and loss. My father killed himself when I was 16. His man-up mentality resembles the old-fashioned stiff upper lip approach to negative emotions and is actually part of the same toxic masculinity Nate is infected with. They are two sides of the same coin, both forms of not really dealing with feelings. Ted even has a mean shouting alter ego led Tasso he occasionally uses on the field, illustrating how he's totally bottled up his not nice self into a separate cartoonish doppelganger. Nate, Ted, and Jamie's internal struggles share a tragic root, absent or inadequate fathers. Jamie's dad pretends that his needlessly cruel verbal abuse will make his son strong. Well, you know, can I go? 
little moody bitch just because you got your ass served to you on a plate. But actually, it just teaches Jamie how to be a status-obsessed bully, something Jamie has to work hard to reform in season two. Ted responded to his fear of abandonment by trying to be the opposite of his father through his relentless optimism, but this has still had an isolating effect on him. Nate's emotionally distant father may be right that his son has an arrogance problem. They say humility is not thinking less of yourself, You're thinking about yourself less. But Mr. Shelley's reaction of withholding approval only makes Nate more desperate to prove himself. All these fathers show us how easy it is to perpetuate the old school masculine ideas that real men don't feel. They tough it out, hold it in, or lash out at those they have power over. On the flip side, the positive impact of a good parental figure is illustrated in Sam's dad. Stop looking for the answer and let the answer come to you. He regularly communicates that he's proud of his son's success. I'm so proud of you, my son. Thank you, dad. But he's also most proud when his son follows his principles. And when he feels Sam isn't doing that, his father isn't distant or indirect, but clearly voices the kind of choice he hopes for from his son. Even though the season exposes the limitations of Ted's positivity, it still greatly values what Ted brings to the world and teaches all of us. Ted Lasso concretely improves the lives of almost everyone his positivity touches. Ted's ability to see the best in everyone is still his superpower, but that power only works if you deal with conflict head on. I want to share with you all the truth about my recent struggles with anxiety and, well, my overall concern about the way we discuss and deal with mental health in athletics. The best lesson to come out of season two is that we have to find a healthy balance of both light and dark. The trick is to be positive but honest and not use positivity as a crutch to avoid difficult truths. In season one, when Ted pushes Nate to pass on his sometimes brutally honest notes directly to the players, this is a healthy example of combining cutting truth with positive intentions in order to make productive change. But your speed and your smarts were never what made you who you are. It's your anger. That's your superpower. That's what made you one of the best midfielders in the history of this league. This episode is actually a great example of how Ted's big picture human insight and Nate's sharp critical thinking could have added up to the perfect balance for Richmond, an observation that makes the season two finale all the more tragic. The light dark balance is also illustrated perfectly in Jamie Tart's transformation from an arrogant prima donna into a sweet team leader. In the first season, Jamie's a toxic negative presence in the Richmond locker room. Not having the best of days. Actually, it doesn't matter what you say, because in my head, I'm just here in the crowd cheering my name after I scored a goal tonight. But then in season two, he almost overcorrects. You've made him a team player. You've got him to pass and shit. And in doing so, you've made him average. So in Jamie, we see how both sides of oneself are important. You can be a team player in the locker room while directing controlled versions of your ego and aggression into the right places, like a highly competitive game. Deep down, at your core, you are a prick. So just be a prick. Roy Kent achieves a lot of balance this season, too. He's not about to ditch his trademark gruff, foul mouth persona. Maybe we can stop swearing together. F you. I can't. But thanks to the power of loving, honest communication, he finds a way to be a better role model, a more supportive boyfriend, and a friend to his former enemy. Even forgiving Jamie for expressing his love to Keeley, duking it out in words instead of with punches. Instead of beating him to death, I fucking forgave him. I'm still fucking furious about it. Meanwhile, Keeley searches for balance on the other side of the spectrum. She's used to being sweet and supportive to everyone around her, but starts to recognize it's time to assert her power as a professional woman. And Rebecca and Dr. Sharon, both incredibly composed professional women, learn to let themselves be more vulnerable, Rebecca in her love life and Sharon in her work. So season two isn't about abandoning positivity. Instead, it's about embracing the complex truth, pausing to listen to ourselves and feeling even our darkest feelings. Really, Ted Lasso shows us that being better requires forgiveness of both others and ourselves. It's natural to hope we'll eventually see Nate punished for his petty or disloyal behavior. But the whole point of Ted's outlook is his willingness to see the very best in everyone, even those who treat him poorly. Ted, I'm so sorry. If you want to quit or call the press, I'll completely understand. I forgive you. 
Nate suffers precisely because he can't forgive. Not the people who once bullied him, not anyone who's expressed even the slightest criticism, rejection, or joke at his expense, and most of all, not himself for his perceived shortcomings. So he lashes out, zeroing in on others' insecurities to try to bring them down to his level of self-loathing. Without me, you wouldn't want a single match and they would have shipped your ass back to Kansas where you f***ing belong. The turning to the dark side moment in the finale is when Ted sees Nate has torn down the team's Believe poster. It's a symbol instructing the team to believe both in themselves and in the collective, because ultimately these two things are inseparable. Nate's tragedy is that, unable to trust in himself, he feels the world is against him, and he must go it alone. Right, when this works, which it will, I'm telling everyone it's my idea, which it was. The Take is now available as a podcast. We're just getting started, so take us with you. As we talked about in this video, toxic positivity can really get you down. That's why it's so important to make time for deeper, meaningful activities in life that aren't all surface. And Skillshare is the ideal place to start. Right now, the first 1,000 viewers to click the link in the description below will get an entire month of Skillshare for free. After dreaming about creating an on-screen story of my own, I tried Ceremony Films course Short Films 101, Plan, Capture, and Edit Cinematic Shorts. It encourages budding directors to make a one-minute movie on any subject they like, and then and walks through how to do it. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning there are zero ads and they're always launching new premium classes. So click the link in the description below and start nourishing your creativity today.